and a one and a two and a three. <laughs> 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 You know, it's 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 really hard to coordinate a song uh, uh, when everybody's in the different room. Well, I didn't. Were we? Because Neil, you were behind by like two seconds. Were we lagging, or you were doing a round robin thing? Uh, I don't know, because I was trying to do this from memory after hearing it like ten years ago. <laughs> see, see, Ian's way up. All right, all right. God damn it, Ian. Hey, everybody! Welcome to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick. I am your host, Johnny Blackburn, and alongside me this week, as they are every week, my partners in crime. Gary Elmore. And Neil Riley. And with us this week, we have our favorite guest, the guy who always insists on coming back, even when he's not invited. He, I guess he just, he follows our blogs, and we, we said we were going to record tonight, and he kind of just showed up. Um, I'm just kidding, guys. I'm not going to do that to Ian, because I love him. I do it to Jacob Johnson, and I, I reserve the right to make fun of Jacob Johnson on every episode. Uh, Ian Webb, welcome back. So hey. happy to have you. Yeah, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know you'd actually have me back. Uh, the cease and desist order hasn't been processed yet, so... True. Uh, very, very, okay. very well, true. Yeah. You're, not, you're not actually joking, though. I mean, everything you said was true. I know. Exactly. No, I, I know that you, you, have, you have very stalkerish tendencies, so... That is something that we we like uh, about you because something I need to work on. Okay, you you no, you don't. I wouldn't say work on it. We need our guests to have a kind of an absurdity to them. You know, they have to have these mm-hmm. really, just really intense, these intense things that uh, normal people don't have. Otherwise, the show's just boring as hell. Mm. So keep well, being you, man. Do what you do. I have, I have something for you for that. Okay. <laughs> Nothing like a sliding whistle. Uh, do you have? Uh, just like a little box with sound effects that you hit no, on no, it, no, or like that's a slide happen? whistle. I, I have a slide whistle. Oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> he, al- he also uses a lot of these same uh, sound effects in his other two podcasts, so he does have oh, them. I'm okay. sure you got a lot. Cute he up. also uses the slide uh, whistle in his love making. So, <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> Not the sound effect. The actual slide that? whistle. I don't feel anything. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to get it for real. Well, it's... It's It's too late. The lag. The lag is there, and it's real, and it's frustrating. Uh, Ian Webb (laughs) is the host of the popular podcast movie So Bad They're Good, Midnight Cult, Classics, and Camp, and the Facebook group of the same name. Uh, and a brand new podcast, um, which I have actually mm-hmm. finally caught up with. Uh, Ian, really quickly, give us a brief rundown of your new podcast that is not film related at all, but it's a hilarious idea. All right. Well, appreciate it. Yeah. It, my new podcast is Having a Beer with Ian. And <laughs> yeah, and that's it. Just that's hilarious. <laughs> I, um, I am Ian. I'm the host. And my co-hosts are Ian, Ian. Ian and Ian, and sometimes we try to get guests on whose names are also Ian. <laughs> Just five Ians getting drunk together, essentially for two <laughs> hours, and literally talking about nothing. It's literally they. Uh, well, I mean, we, the, we the conversations go quick. from. I try. To, oh I yeah, try to I mean have it's a topic, but. <laughs> It's a good idea. You had told me when I was first listening to it. You prefaced it by saying this is essentially like a bunch of friends in a bar trying to talk over the loud music. Yeah. Uh, and it's just people yelling over each other and it's mm-hmm. really entertaining. I, I, I well, really I enjoy listening that. to it. Yeah. It, it, it <laughs> very much is like the bar climb, like attitude, like, um, you're pretty much, we're all just drinking together. We're having a conversation. We're trying to have uh, a topic, but we get carried away. And yeah, <laughs> it ends up with us just like making fun of each other and just roasting each other. <laughs> Ah, man, whatever. It's cool. Uh, it's it's super entertaining. I know that you guys are currently attempting to start something called Ian Con. Yes. Uh, and you're trying, uh, <laughs> right? You're trying to uh, compete well, against the... Let, let me explain. <laughs> uh, I, I have stumbled up, up upon a Facebook group. This one not made by me, but um, right. it's called yeah. The Council of Ian's. Uh, which I, at the time when I discovered it, which was, I believe, in October... Uh, maybe September. Uh, the, there were about three or four hundred of us, and, and now we're up to nine hundred. It's Damn. growing quick. That's, that's pretty fast, man. That's pretty. That's pretty quick. What are the requirements to be on this council? 
Well, your name has to be Ian. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, does it have it's to very be segregated. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can, yeah. Nobody, nobody outside. I mean, unless your name is no, na- name only. We, we, uh, we <laughs> I, accept I know all, that. <laughs> all races and genders, although there's not very many outside. <laughs> to be honest, there's not very many Ian's outside of white males. But there, there are, de- there are definitely there. Uh, we, we do yeah. have uh, men and women of of all ethnicities. And you uh, all, you got I mean, you got you got Indo Ian all over the world. That, that, that dude's from Indonesia, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Exactly. I love his, yeah, I love his nickname. Indo Ian. <laughs> yeah, we give each other nicknames. <laughs> uh, so ch- check check them out. We'll let you plug again at the end. Uh, let's get going. We got a we got a long episode. For those of you that uh, actually listened to us in season one, uh, we have actually. Oh God! I think overall we've we've more than quadrupled our fan base from the beginning of season oh, one. Awesome. And on most episodes now it's four. Huh? Now we have four people. Now we have four people. <laughs> no, and uh, on some episodes we're even. Uh, we've got uh, ten to twelve times more than we originally had to start. So it's so we're we're getting bigger. So for those of you that have, if you've binged through season one so far, you will have come across an episode at the beginning um, before Neil even joined us. Uh, before we had many other guests, it was just me, Gary, and Ian, and we had gone over an episode on best directors and most uh, overrated directors of all time. Debates got pretty hot. It was pretty tense. Uh, we said a lot of things that we regret saying to each other, and we feel bad about it. So we want to dive into it more because <laughs> everybody loves intense drama. And let's check it out. Uh, we're going to be checking out the best directors of all time today. Everybody's going to come in with their own personal list uh, for the top five. Then we're going to try to collectively come up with a Mount Rushmore of the greatest of all time. Uh, we'll see how that works. Uh, and then towards the end, we'll go ahead and give a couple of recommendations for underrated directors and young directors that are up and coming that uh, you should check out some of their work so let's just jump in, let's jump into it uh we're gonna start off with <laughs> we're gonna start off on the opposite end of the spectrum and i, I do want to have a very quick argument about this quick debate um ian and i have talked and and gary's mentioned this too um we've talked about neil breen in a lot of different episodes uh how he is in my opinion the worst director of all time and I don't understand how he gets the money to keep making movies, but he does it anyways. Ian has been telling me constantly that he is misunderstood (laughs) and his films are deeper than... (laughs) Ian is misunderstood or Neil Breen? Ian is telling me that Neil Breen is misunderstood. Ian is also misunderstood. True. That's why he he identifies with Neil Breen. Fair enough, fair enough. (laughs) So, Ian, I'm going to let you jump right into this, man. Why the hell Uh, is Neil Breen misunderstood? What are we missing? uh, Well, I never said that. He's misunderstood. Okay. And, right. In fact, I, I, sure. I, uh, I'm sure you didn't. Okay. Um, I came here actually ready to uh, tell you that he's not misunderstood. Okay. With Neil Brain, you know what you're getting into. Uh, he, no, you he, don't. He's, uh, <laughs> but okay, keep going. Sorry. No, I mean, if you know Neil Brain, <laughs> if you've watched one movie, you've watched them all. There are. I watched all. all exactly I watched all of them, the and, I, and I never. No. That, I, <laughs> <laughs> if you're talking about incoherent plot lines and dialogue that makes no fucking sense, then yeah, I guess yeah, they're all the yeah, same. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That, yeah, exactly. So, okay. All right. Let, that's let what me, you want in a movie? Over. As okay. a connoisseur of the so bad they're good genre, uh, that, that is movies that are so terrible that they're funny and right, entertaining right. Yes. and enjoyable, he right. is like incredible. And so, like, if, like if that's what you want, if you actually want to laugh at a movie because it's so bad, you go to No Brain. So he's not misunderstood. He's exactly what you're looking for if you're looking for that type of movie. Well, then, when we, you and I talked about it originally, I drastically misunderstood what you were saying because <laughs> that is not what I gathered from our conversation at all. Um, I, I gathered that you you said he was very entertaining, which on yeah. a certain level, yeah, I could agree that you know movies that are horrible like that are fun to watch with other people and make fun of. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think there's any. I've I've read blogs. So there's a, bro- a group that you and I are both a part of. Um, Gary Neal, I don't know if you, I invited you guys. I don't know if you joined it. Um, but it's that Neil Breen fan group on Facebook. Yes, and they yeah, talk about yeah. how his movies have these deeper meanings 
And most of those people are just trolls. But every once yeah. in a while, you come across somebody that actually believes this shit, uh, yeah. and it just baffles me. It's a, uh, it's it's a very confusing, rocky road. <laughs> to yes, travel yes, on. to say the um, least. Like, I mean, I I I've seen all of his movies enough times to kind of grasp where he's coming from, like what he's trying to sure. say. Uh, right. I mean, first of all, they're they're all definitely. Uh, like if you take I am here right now, um it's it's a movie about <sighs> government corruption. Well, I mean they all are. All of his but, movies are about government corruption. But I, I mean, just it, killed three hundred million people. He, he <laughs> is uh I, I don't know. I, like <sighs> He he definitely has a message he's trying to tell. He just doesn't know how to tell it. Um, sure, I think his the message that he's trying to tell is copied from every other director in Hollywood over the last dude, couple uh, decades. I mean, it's it's not new, man. Like corruption is what, corruption no, and big corporations. It's, not new. I, I it's never said it was like, new. Um, I'm just uh, well, okay. So uh, let me tell you why I like No Brain. How about that? Um, sure. He By all means. Had, I mean, other than what I already said, he he's an incompetent director that is hilarious to watch. But um, he also has a certain style that is you un- very unique and is very present in all of his films, all five of them. Pandemonium. Um, okay. he, Chaos. I mean, if you know, like. He, Okay, if if you enjoy one of his films, you will not be disappointed by another one. There, like he stays true to his roots, and he um, he also has a lot of heart. You know, um, <laughs> like Tommy Wiseau, mm-hmm. like he loves making movies, and no matter how bad it, he is at it he sure. like there's a lot of heart in it and you can tell that this guy is just really just doing what he loves he pretty much quit his career as an architect to to make films and he shouldn't have done that <laughs> well we don't, we don't know what, it, what his architecture looks like so <laughs> <laughs> i mean if he had enough money to make all these movies it must have been not horrible i don't know yeah. look man i get what i get what you're saying um I, what I was saying, what I was saying earlier, what I was being like, oh, you know, you're you're trying to like I- explain and prove why he's entertaining. Um, any any person who is an incompetent filmmaker is entertaining. I don't think Neil Breen is anything special when it comes to that. All of those, every director that makes a movie for the most part has heart, and they stay true to themselves. You're right; he does stay true to himself. That is for sure. I will give him that. Um, but th- yeah, but I guess I mean he just sticks out so much. Like his his incompetence level is so high, and he seems so unaware of it. They're like, so horrendous that it's that it's yeah, he, you can like tell. he thinks yeah. he's as, as same with Tommy Wiseau, or at least as far as the room Tommy Wiseau, because now Tommy is self aware. But uh, uh, Frenemies uh, wasn't supposed to be very good either, from what I saw. <laughs> well, he didn't make that movie; he only started it. Basically, what what I'm saying is he like he is the best of so bad as good. Okay, anyway, well, that's a good segue yeah. into the into the next question. Worst director of all time, <laughs> and I want to preface this by I want to preface this by saying uh, I've got you can say whoever you want. Uh, I can be even a big budget filmmaker if you really want to. I put four guys on there on 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 my list for consideration: uh, Tommy Wiseau, Neil Breen, James Nguyen, and Claudia Fragasso. And these people either directed one really notable movie so bad it's good or a series of them um why sow as you guys saw did the room and he did a he did some coll- co- um collaborating with uh, the tim and eric show mm. uh he did he produced some other stuff and some he yeah, did some shorts man. yeah the, there you go um, <laughs> neil breen i'm sure you can name off the five he's done uh james nguyen for those of you that aren't familiar he did bird demic one and two uh, he's he's working on a third one right now, which apparently is reported to have almost a twenty million dollar budget for some fucking really? reason. Yeah, and then Cla- <laughs> uh, Cla- Claudia Fergasso did Troll Two, which I need to let people know this has nothing to do with the original Troll. There wasn't a Troll One anywhere. 
Like, there was not a troll series this was connected to. He just named it Troll 2 because there was some other famous troll movie there was, back Yeah, then. Yeah, there was a movie called Troll. Yeah. And it's it, a completely it different movie. Yeah, and yeah. He, they did it for uh, for marketing ploy so people would try to pick up, try to pick it up. Uh, but Nilberg is goblin spelled backwards. <laughs> it, but, it did, you know, it, it didn't work at all. Apparently, he actually works with a fully Italian-speaking crew. And so when they went to Utah to shoot Troll 2... Uh, the actors they were working with outside of having no experience also all only spoke English. So it took twice as long to shoot the fucking movie because his crew, you know, they barely spoke it. They barely spoke English. So this, you get two different languages going back and forth between the cast and crew. Um, and it made them, I mean, it didn't really matter in general. The movie was constantly referred to as one of the worst of all time. There, there's a great um, documentary. Um, it's called, I think called the, the best worst movie best, worst movie ever made that's about troll too yeah, yeah. and uh, it's, it's like the child star who's the lead yeah. or something directed yeah, it, it. it it's it's a great documentary about troll too because there's this I guy in it. it um um and he's like an old guy by the time they do the documentary and they're like and he's just kind of just talking about his life since troll too and he's like well, I guess I've just, you know, been sitting around not really doing anything since the movie came out. But what is there to do in life aside from fritter it away? <laughs> it's just it's great. And didn't didn't one of them say uh, as it because it was constantly referred to as the worst movie of all time. And he was saying, well, it doesn't matter if it's the worst movie of all time or the best movie of all time. The fact is, it made an impact and people are still talking about it. Yeah. yeah, those, those uh, are those assholes uh, yeah. that are like, oh, I, I shit into a bucket and put it in a museum so it's art. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That might be why we made Eye of the Beholder. <laughs> yeah. It might be it like might that $2,000 spray painted tumbleweed that we found in Marfa, Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which was, it cost more than to make Eye of the Beholder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was. It was a couple hundred less that we spent. Uh, so I, I'll leave I, I will, I'll leave it open to the panel. Uh, worst director of all time. Who does pop into your mind really quick? Um, uh, Ian, let's start with you on this one. Uh, you do, do you think Neil Breen is is the creme de la creme? No, creme de la okay, creme. Um, I mean, yeah, he he is terrible. Um, mm -hmm. my 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 bias aside, I mean, I do love him, but you're, you're right, he he is fucking awful. Everybody you mentioned, <laughs> the, those are uh, you know, those are the top guys. The, like you must be the best worst direct, right? The most notable, the most notable for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. but also the most yeah. enjoyable. Uh, there, there's directors out there who uh, just make total shit that is. Not only worse, but less than entertaining. Uh, <laughs> uh, the the one I picked is uh, actually uh, a good friend of Claudio Fergasso. Uh, uh, his name is Bruno Mattei. Okay, what's he done? He, he is an Italian director. He he did um, okay. Robo Wars great, but um, an, another one he did Terminator Two. Wait a minute, Terminator Two? Yep, it came out in 1989. <laughs> All right, let me explain. Well, it, yeah, what is he, what he, I mean, is that what they called it? Two minutes into your judgment day? No. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I know it's Terminator, not the same movie, obviously, but. <laughs> yeah, he, in 1989, this guy did a movie called Terminator 2, uh, which had to be changed to Shocking Dark the next well, year when the <laughs> actual, when the real Terminator 2 came out. This movie is, uh, has nothing to do with Terminator. It's a blatant ripoff of Aliens. Um, really? <laughs> yeah, all this, all the movies this guy does are just complete blatant ripoffs okay. of popular. Movies. So why is the, why is this guy the worst of all time? Though is my question. Well, is it because he's ripping all, people off, or oh, yeah, he has no originality. Whereas the guys okay. you mentioned have originality; they actually like create their own story. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as little a little as there is, this guy just does blatant ripoffs. Like, um, shock okay. or sorry, uh, Robo War is a blatant ripoff of Predator, it, it, except for much cheaper budget, oh, uh, okay. really terrible directing. I mean, it, this is this is just like Neil Brain director. Director sure. kills or Claudio Fagasso. In fact, Claudio Fagasso is in this movie. Um, he plays the Predator. Uh, so th this is uh, it's the exact same movie, scene for scene. A bunch of army guys in the jungle, and then there's a Predator who's attacking them one by one. But instead of like an alien, it's just a robot that just talks to itself. 
and it's just Claudio Figasso, the director of Troll 2, in a robot suit. Huh. And, that's uh, really stupid. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. That sounds boring uh, as hell. Sounds wonderful. Yeah, it, it's it's ter- like he's so terrible. And uh we we covered both uh Terminator 2 and Robo War on on my old uh, podcast. Not movie so right, better right. I mean I call classics camp, but movie so better good. The, the one before that, right. Yeah, and yeah. uh sure. I mean I saw Robo War in the theater and it was fun in the theater, but it is not fun if you're not surrounded okay. by a drunk crowd at midnight. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody. I don't think anybody here is a, a fan of of directors ripping off other people. I think that's something we all kind of frown upon know, for sure. I mean, it's like you know? it's like, hey, Johnny, do you like Predator or Aliens? Absolutely. <laughs> Would you like to watch them again, but a much, much, much lower budget and a very terrible cast? If it's a shot for shot remake with the exact same dialogue, uh, I would be entertained to do it one time with a bunch of friends so we can make fun of it. Yeah, I'd, I'd be down. But yeah, no, I would not normally want to do that. Uh, OK, well, that, that's a good one. I, I had never heard of that guy before, so maybe we'll uh, we'll have to check him out in our, our weekly uh, movie watching stuff. Uh, anyways, Gary, how about you? Uh, well, I mean, there are a lot of directors and uh that make movies that are really, I think, boring to watch. Sure. Like, uh, like yeah. the overall, like I'm going to blame a director if the movie is boring, like, cause mm-hmm. they overall have the command of the ship and what happens in the movie. Um, and I, yeah, for me, Neil Breen, I think is definitely probably the worst director because his movies, uh, Especially since he has such creative control over it, since he writes, directs, acts, stars, and shoots produces. most of it, and yeah, edits, and, and yeah. like they they don't make any sense. Um, they and they're just really like, I, I if you were drunk or inebriated in some fashion, you know, they might be kind of interesting, but like you know, it's just basically him going out into the desert all the time and screaming about how he wants to kill most of the people on earth. And, you know, he's a Messiah. Don't forget. He's a Messiah and he's to save humanity. Uh, he usually always has does. like, yeah, he, yeah. He, usually, he always has like five laptops with him. Um, <laughs> he does. And that's, that's pretty much the, the bulk of what his movies are. And I, I think that they just are so, poorly done and he doesn't get better at it like no um i don't remember what the last movie he did was um but it was where they were he had i guess uh, had a yeah when uh he got on to a, a college campus uh, and they allowed <laughs> him to shoot there uh for the movie <laughs> for and he, turn the lights he, on. Uh, yeah and he uh he he that light tried to do some oh. lighting, which is like kind of a like a, a narrow band of light to go across the character's <laughs> eyes like 56 <laughs> times in that movie. Jeez. Like you remember watching that? Yeah. Yeah. Gary, yeah. I remember yeah. I, I was commenting on it and yelling at the yeah. TV for an hour and a half yeah. about how horrible this. I was like, he didn't even have the money to hire a, a, someone that had done gaffing Ooh. on an indie film before mm-hmm. like a, a college student like just hire a college student who's yeah. in uh, you know i don't know grip gaffing 101 mm-hmm. and then let them take it like don't do it on your own if you don't know how to do it right it takes well, years to learn how to perfect how to light a movie yeah <laughs> and i mean just everything is uh a failure in those movies the acting is usually awful awful the story is uh, it's incomprehensive it, c- convoluted at yeah. best uh the the that's, cinemat- that's a that's yeah, yeah that's even pretty that's stretching it <laughs> the, the cinematography is is boring and flat like i can't think of a interesting shot in any they're of they're mostly movies. statics yeah for the most part um like i just and like none of those really uh get any better you know and so i'm going to say that like even more than like an ed wood uh, cause at least he had some, like he was a low budget Z-movies, director. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and even more than like, on the list. <laughs> he, he was certain, he was certainly in contention there. Um, but and then, and then these like, ones my I, I could even see somebody making an argument for Michael Bay in a way. Cause all his movies are just explosions, but you know, they're popcorn movies. They're fun, you know, so I can, I can at least get behind, you know what you're going to see there and you know what you're going to see at a Neil Breen movie. And it's not, it's not anything fun, you want to see. It's just at least, I mean, you know, then we, we are on the complete opposite 
end of the spectrum from Ian on this one uh, that we just find it to be very boring. Yeah, I forgive you. And whatever, I know, a t- I know a ton of people, I know from that group at least, I know a ton of people that, that really love watching his stuff and they find it really hilarious. Um, yeah, so Gary, uh, my I'm not, group as well. I'm not even, yeah, I'm not even going to say anything because you literally said everything okay. I was going to say. I completely agree. Neil Breen is the worst <laughs> director in the history of cinema, if you want to call his movies actual film right yeah. uh, neil i'm gonna jump to you uh who do you think is is if not the worst one of the worst directors ever so for me neil breen he's he's a horrible director but he also has like the no budget to like do anything worth noting so to me a horrible director is someone who is given lots and lots of money and just turns out crappy movies and to me one of the worst directors has to be uh m night shamalama Lama ding dong uh he came out he came out swinging hard you know he had six cents he had unbreakable which all did really well in the box office all had had great views but then he just went downhill fast you know Signs has like 67% on Rotten Tomatoes. The Village is like 43%. Lady of Water is like 25%. I ha- I have to say that la- I have to say that Lady in the Water might be the worst big budget movie I've I've seen in my life. Well, stand honestly. by cuz he also has The Happening uh 17%. That's true. That's yeah. true. So, the so he, he, the just, he just conned people into thinking he was a good director because he pumped out one or two good movies. And then people just started handing him money and he's just turning out crap. Like After Earth right. with the uh, oh, uh, God. With Earth? the Smiths? He did After Earth. He directed it, produced it. And it's like 11% yep. on Rotten Tomatoes. Like, that was to me, he's just that was... not worth the money. Uh, can I ask you a question? Actually, good point, Neil. Um, <laughs> So I, I think like most people's problem with, with him is that is the script is usually he tries to just make a, a plot twist and that kind of unravels everything. Uh, how, how do you feel about his everything else? Like as far as like directing style or, you know, every, other, anything other than the script? I mean, some, some of the, the shots, I think uh, he does real, real well, like cinematography wise but where the movies fall apart is definitely the the screenwriting uh he does try to turn those twists in there a lot of the twists you see coming um but like his his timing is really slow his movies are usually too slow for me a lot of times you find with directors that have hit a home run early on in their career for some reason they all try to like to take the stories that they either write or that they find to get greenlit they try to add in multiple protagonists instead of just one or two, and they try to make them super complex. So if you mm-hmm. look at Orson of, Welles, Orson Welles was yeah was was yeah sure, um, but in particular after Unbreakable, you go and you look at you kind of look at science, you see it start to happen. Mel Gibson was supposed to be the sole focal point of that movie, and they try to add in a little too much with um, Merrill, played by Joaquin Phoenix, his brother, the kids. Um, they try to focus yeah. on a little too much with the the main police officer um m night Shyamalan in general they actually that was the most screen time he had had in one of his own movies in quite some time um and then you go to lady in the water which crappening was really bad and i'll agree with you on that one neil um that one was bad but lady in the water to me is my least favorite of his and it actually was the coolest idea um but he you took paul giamatti and they should have just focused in on him and bryce dallas howard's characters and instead they tried to focus on everybody and everybody had a story within a story but oh wait there's another side story and if you do that for eight people it just it just becomes like stories yeah yeah, it's convoluted it just becomes too much I, i will say his worst movie is the visit in my opinion, you think it was worse than the, the yeah. even the happening? Yeah, because I don't the, know about that. Man. I mean, the visit was. There's a part in it where an, a crazy old man shits his pants and then funny. rubs it in the face of a kid. Do you and, remember when the grandmother plays hide and seek with him under the yeah. deck? Uh, <laughs> it's just a just the stupidest, scary. most retardedest movie ever. It's it's awful. It was pretty fucking stupid. Uh, Neil, good point. I mean, yeah, there's certainly different levels and tiers of uh, of bad directors, whether they have a budget or not. So let's move on. I want to talk about great directors, and we're going to spend the rest of the episode talking about that. So I want to check with you guys. Um, I had a, I gave a couple examples on there about 
what makes a great director. We're not, we don't have to talk about all of those. I just, those were examples of things you might want to consider. Um, what does make a great director? Uh, you know, I mean, is it, you know, I, we, we talk, we look at uh, Spielberg is really famous for his staging and blocking of scenes. He can change a really mundane scene between two people for, you know, it's a 90 second scene. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, because of blocking and placement, uh, in the room where a certain line is delivered, it delivers a more powerful message than if it was delivered when the guy was sitting down yeah, over here. I mean, like, just or, think about how, like, um, just for, to take Spielberg, because I think he's sort of the gold standard. Um, yeah. Uh, like, compare, yeah, like, right. if he had directed um, the talking scenes in um, the prequel trilogy for Star Wars <laughs> versus George Lucas. Sure. Like, because it was just like a flat shot for shot in George yeah. Lucas. But mm -hmm. Spielberg, you know, the scenes get life. You know, and he animates it yeah, with the movement. And yeah. Spielberg is a very powerful storyteller. He is. And he is. He is really good. And I'm sure he'll be on our some probably all of our top fives or at least some of them. Um, so we had we had staging and blocking. There's there's pacing and editing. There's delivery of dialogue and interpretation of the text, timing of Foley cues and the impact of the score that you use and how you cut it up. Um, ability to utilize the visual medium through lighting and camera angles, shots, um, something like where you know Kubrick has has and Christopher Nolan where they hang their hats, you know. Um, because if, for for those of you that don't know, I guess you know the director they may not necessarily have written the script every single time, but they are in the room once the script has been you know once it's on its whatever 20th draft or something and about to be greenlit they're in there given their recommendations then they're they're all the way through production and then they are there with the editors in post not as many hours but for the most part they're they're in the room with them and they're they're in their ear they're telling them hey i need this here cut early take this splice from the opening minute credit add it into minute 17 during this line whatever mm -hmm. um so there's a lot that goes into it so Let's just pick one or two, one or two things to add together. What do you think makes a great director? What is the strongest aspect uh, of the director? If you're going to say storytelling, go into it a little bit more. What a what what ability with their storytelling makes them great? Because that's kind of vague. Um, so I, I'll 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 go ahead and start with yeah, Gary yeah. since you kind of already were talking about Spielberg. So what do you think makes a great director to you? To me, a great director is someone who makes you feel like you're in the story. And okay. That's done. I, it, well, it's well, a combination of everything. Sure. Um, a lot of it is sh like the, the way they shoot and pace the shot. So like, if you look at like Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson, yeah. whom the only good movies he did, I, I, I don't well, like most of his movies, kidding, but I, I think he just really did Brain an excellent <laughs> job yeah. with uh, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, you know, those movies, when you watch them, you become part of that world. Like Steven Spielberg, when you watch like Jaws, you feel like you're on a boat and you're afraid to go in the water. You know, that to me is when it when it brings it to life, what's going on when you watch. um uh, uh, like a movie like Jurassic Park or something, and you like you you feel the majesty and the the impressive nature of the dinosaurs or the wonder of you know the world. That is when you have a good director, sure. and that I think is brought around with with not only directing how the actors. Uh, how they act, deliver their lines, you know, the blocking, the the real basic mundane stuff, right. but you know how you're approaching the story like right. how how clear a vision do you have and how do you communicate that to the cast and crew to get that on cellulite because you really have to and that's part of a movie is made in the casting room it's made with the casting director and the director and whatever producers are there mm -hmm. and spielberg is notorious for casting his movies almost perfectly and i know outside of i guess et and bridge of spies pretty much everything he's ever done you've really liked yeah. right am i correct in in saying that yeah I, yeah okay yeah. so and I, I he was when we did this episode last time my favorite director was scorsese ian took kubrick and mm -hmm. you took spielberg and i we i think ian and i for the most part we almost agreed with you wholeheartedly pre-2000 remember that conversation right, yeah. we had about that so what a, yeah you remember so what about so Spielberg is the epitome. Uh, he's the top. I, I would say chain. he's sort of the gold standard. Okay, he's for, the gold standard. Modern directors. What would you say? Would you? What would you say specifically makes a good director? Then from from him, what do you take from him that makes a good director? Is it the staging and blocking? Is that the most important thing? Do you think? No, I mean it's 
when I say like the ability to tell a story, I mean, it, it like when you're, when you have somebody like sitting around a campfire telling a story, it's how they move and interact and the voices they make and how they bring it to life. Right. And the same with a director behind the camera. So how do they capture what's going on in the world? Uh, either, you know, actually through like real special effects or CGI or just filming the actor's faces, deciding on the makeup, deciding on the wardrobe. Right. How do they bring all of those pieces together to make, you know, the whole be more than the sum of the parts. Sure. And I think that, you know, we were talking earlier today about uh, Tom Brady and his management of the we, we were, football yeah. team. You know, Tom no, Brady he's 43 and still winning Super Bowls. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Brady didn't have the best arm, but like not anymore. He, he's got the most Super Bowl. It's because so heavy weighed down with Super Bowl rings. Right. Um, OK, calm down. But like, <laughs> but no, uh, oh, <laughs> what I'm saying is that um, it, it may not be that like Spielberg or any director you really like is the best at deciding where the camera needs to go, but they know they have a good DP that they work with, or they're able to communicate with their, you know, director of photography to help communicate okay. that vision and make it cohesive. Otherwise you get kind of like, um, like if you look at Paul Feig, right. um, like, he, uh, like his movies are just a mess. They don't have any direction. Like, and I, I think that, you know, he, he lets the actors really, really kind of go it, sorry the guy that did spy and bridesmaids yeah and ghostbusters 2016 oh, i don't agree with that at all i think ghostbusters was a train wreck but i've never seen anything of his that i sorry keep going anyways well what, what i mean is they're not like focused mm -hmm. like because the actors are doing whatever the actors want to do yeah and it, it gets away from him as a director and okay. i think that uh a, a good storyteller can make everybody's get everybody marching in the same direction to tell the you same can utilize kind of story. their strengths and combine them in a cohesive yeah because if you've okay. got somebody taking a part seriously and then you've got somebody else it's just kind of like this is going to be a zany show it's the tone is going to be okay. off okay and that may work in some movies where you might have like uh who framed roger rabbit like you know you got yeah. um uh, Bob Hoskins, who's taking it very, he's like a serious character, like a noir detective. And then you've got a cartoon rabbit. Yeah. But for most movies, that doesn't really work. So you're saying, so basically just to sum up everything, you're saying that the best director is a really good game manager, is a good conductor, kind of like a Steve Jobs thing. They may not necessarily have one thing they do specifically well, but they're really good at a lot of things and they're good at managing the people that do those things really well. Right. Cause yeah. You know? Cause I mean like what a JFK JFK was the one that said that, right. He was like, it doesn't matter if you're this, it doesn't matter how smart you are. It matters how, how many smart people you put around you or how many, how many, uh, critical thinkers you put around you or the, mm -hmm. the team talking about the team that you build. Right. You know? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, no, I, I suppose that is that that's a good point. Yeah. So I, um, I guess that that's kind of a combo between the director and the producer. Yeah. Um, so I think that. Yeah, I think that the, the kind of a, is a crossover, but I see what you're saying. Um, for me personally, I, I would say, and I agree with you on a lot of stuff. I think I like the visual medium. Um, I'm not in this, and I'm sure Ian will talk about this in a second. I'm not in the same boat as 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 you, as you know, because um, I, I, I like the visual aesthetic. I think that's really entertaining, and I think it does add a lot to the film. Uh, but to me the most important thing is pacing and editing. And it's always been the most important thing to me. And the directors that can come in, and even if the script I've noticed, even if the script is not terribly strong, if they can come in and they can cut at the right time on the right sound and at the right camera shot, and if they can mix things well enough in post uh, to create that the feel that you want from the end of the movie, if they're talented enough at that, they can turn it into a really good film. Mm -hmm. You know, what was that uh, movie we watched? Deathbed last night. <laughs> we watched that. <laughs> Ian, have you seen that? You seen Deathbed? Uh, I've been meaning to. I, I actually it, have not, but I've been meaning it's to. It's really yeah, boring. The, the, yeah, the it was. Uh, yeah, yeah, the bed that eats. It was really boring, man. Like we thought it was going to be like one of those because it's always named up there with like. Yeah. The room in Miami Connection and Samurai Cop, and it's always up there. Yeah, and that, it was just boring. It so it's really slow and boring. That's why I haven't yeah. watched it yet. I, I hated it. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> but, 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 but you're kind of saying if you had a good editor for that, it might have only been 30 minutes. That one would have been a little different because there was very little dialogue, and there were not uh, the soundtrack. The sound, the score wasn't. There was a non-existent score. I mean, they used the same score for every scene almost. Mm -hmm. Um. 
and there wasn't really much to work with. You mm. know, that's why I look at a guy like Martin Scorsese or Quentin Tarantino, who are both master storytellers in post-production. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're very good at not only picking the right song to go with the correct scene, but they cut the line and they or they leave the picture rolling on a character's face for just the right amount of time. Mm-hmm. You deliver a line to me, but the camera stays on your face for a solid five seconds after your line delivery is finished. Mm-hmm. And it delivers that really powerful punch and that tense drama that wouldn't be the same if after your line was delivered, the camera switched over to my reaction. Right. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. And so for me, a script is always my biggest thing, but sometimes the director doesn't write the script. So for me, I would say pacing and editing is um, is the is the greatest uh, building block for a great director. Um, Neil, what about you? I mean, all those points you've said are valid. I, I agree with Gary. Um, and you, I mean, the script is obviously the meat and potatoes of, of the sure. film, but uh, I also think what makes a great director is being able to uh, use sound and music. And like you said, Quentin Tarantino has got to be one of the most masterful people at putting together soundtracks oh, yeah. that just resonate with the film. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Ian, how about you? So... Yeah, you, you you're absolutely correct in everything you said, uh, like, like pacing and everything. And for the most part, I completely agree. Uh, yeah, I think that um, all of my favorite directors pace really well. And the thing about yeah. Kubrick, though, I, I think he has really good pacing. Actually, it's just a much different speed yeah <laughs> well, it's, know, a, it's a different he, he has a different style his style is so different, different from the, the ones and, we mentioned uh, so uh, yeah. yeah so and, and as you mentioned earlier yeah visual aesthetics very important to me uh it's it's i don't really look for one thing exactly um i pretty much i'm sure you do that's the question. Though. Yeah, all, all, all <laughs> I, I my, agree that. <laughs> yeah, all my favorite directors are all pretty much unique in different ways, such as you know Kubrick. He he tells a story in one shot. It's just one like, especially like, and I actually I think I brought this up, and and the first director's episode. That is pretty cool. If you take yeah. Clockwork Orange, the very first scene is a extreme close up of of alex's face and then it very slowly mm-hmm. uh, expands and turns and, and the camera goes backwards and it reveals more and more and more and just that right. one shot is so incredible because it, it tells an entire story just in that shot just by going from extreme close-up to regular close-up to you know further away shots and then eventually it's an extreme far away shot and it's it's amazing and nobody else really does that or can really do that in a way i mean so pretty much what i'm saying is uh something i i really look forward to what makes a great director is somebody who who's groundbreaking who, who does something different that nobody has either done before or if you take okay. like tarantino somebody who takes old stuff and kind of recycles it and makes something new out of it with a new flair yeah Yeah, for sure paying homage to the greats uh, yeah Yeah, many many different reasons yeah no no yeah and 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 like i prefaced before the question there's there's a lot of different qualities that make a great director every director that we're about to talk about and that we've mentioned so far they're not only good at one thing they're all good at multiple things otherwise they wouldn't be fucking millionaires and they (laughs) wouldn't have created so many classics uh so let's jump in let's go to uh top five greatest directors of all time here's how we're gonna do it um we're gonna keep it open panel and everybody go ahead and give starting with number five on your list if you don't have them in uh in order right now i'm gonna give i'll start and i'll give you take an opportunity to order them one through five really quick um you just uh, get as best as you can uh we'll start with five and we'll go uh, i'll do one gary ian neil and then we'll circle back around and neil would start i guess and then we'll do our number four so like around number Robin. three two Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. And we'll switch up the order and all that. Um, you, you're welcome to give a very, very brief um, 
rundown of why you think uh, or maybe some movies they've done, please keep it to like under 30 seconds just for time constraints, because we've still got a lot of other stuff to discuss. Um, but I do want to hear what you guys have to say. So I'll, if you guys haven't put them in order yet, uh, since I didn't specify that originally, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, my number five for greatest directors of all time. Uh, I personally love Clint Eastwood. Uh, I thought uh, actually when I was younger, I didn't know that he had directed so many of his his own movies. Actually, uh, I didn't know he had directed Unforgiven. I didn't know he had directed any of the spaghetti westerns. And then he comes out and smashes me in the face with a movie called Mystic River, which oh, yeah. I don't know if you guys even remember that, yep. but that was actually slighted for best picture that year. Uh, I never knew that he could do a crime drama and get out of the Western. And then he comes out with million dollar baby. And then he came out with Gran Torino and then he came out with American sniper and some other ones that were, that were pretty good. And he's just, he's able to genre jump and it surprises the, it surprised the hell out of me showing that I thought he was actually a better director than actor, um, overall. So I'll, I'll move on. Uh, Gary, who is your number five? My number five is Frank Capra. I, nice. I was debating Clint Eastwood for number yeah. five too, but, uh, he's an honorable mention. Me yeah. Too, yeah. Actually. Frank, <laughs> yeah. 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 He's, yeah. He surprised a lot of us. Uh, Frank Capra was, a uh, the oldest director on my list. Uh, he was in the thirties and forties primarily. Uh, he did things like Mr. Smith goes to Washington um he was really good at capturing that element of uh that patriotism like when like mr deeds goes to mr deeds is one of his movies too um and i i just i think he really builds the emotional climax of the his films very well that's very rare for a director to do especially back then because remember we talked about during the studio system everything was so restricted Mm -hmm. to one certain area and you didn't have the leeway to jump around and try to build off people's emotions you know he talked about the patriotism but there were times in his movies where he talked about some controversial stuff Mm -hmm. for the 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 50s and the 60s and for the 40s you know yeah so it it was nice um uh ian let's go ahead and jump to you who was your number five this one is a bit out of the box um no great it's uh i don't think he's one of the best but i I mean i had to put him on there just because he's so influential and innovative uh this is alejandro yudorowski who uh all right i i I, I brought him up in the cult film one of the episode that we did he did he's an underrated one he is the father of midnight movies and yeah. and cult film basically. Uh, he he did El Topo, which is the very Topo, first yeah. midnight movie. It it spawned the whole genre by um, it, like it was so out of the box, so different, so right uh, innovative that it was sold out in one small theater for every night for eight months, and and then like. Ooh all of a sudden the midnight movie slash grindhouse kind of thing started from that. And then he did many other just fantastic films. Uh, I don't think he, that's why I put him in number five. I don't think he's the best. And there's other directors who I think are much better, but I mean, I I had to put him in there. But to be to be a trailblazer like he was, because I, I I was not thinking about him, but I would totally agree with you. El Topo in particular. um, And I've seen that one a couple of times. Oh, you have. Um, is, yeah, I have. And it, you're right. He was he was a trailblazer and and he was very influential, you know. And yeah, this mm-hmm. list is totally this is totally um, able to to be shot for that. So, Neil, what about you? Who is your number five? So my number five, uh, probably not on everybody's radar or list. But for me, one of my favorite directors of all time is Ron Howard. Uh, he's done a yeah. bunch of great movies, uh, you know, yes. all the team Frost Nixon, uh, the Da Vinci Code. Uh, I just think he's a very good storyteller, and I think he does well at um, portraying a lot of human emotion from from his actors. Frost Nixon might have actually been it's it's probably in my top three for most underrated political films of all time. Because uh, if you've actually gone back and watched or listened, I guess, to the tapes between uh, Richard Nixon and David Frost in those interviews, it's it's almost shot for shot a remake in it. I mean, just the way that they were able to completely impersonate the characters was so just, no originality in the story. You know, <laughs> just my, like, but, you know, but do you know how difficult yeah, I know you're yeah. kidding, but do you know how difficult that is to be able to impersonate mm-hmm. somebody to a T like that? I mean, that's, that's yeah, masterful. It's and always impressive. It yeah. And it doesn't, 
it doesn't just come by just the actor. Like there has to be direction to get them there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a good pick, Neil. Um, so Neil, I, I'm just going to go ahead and we'll we'll round robin it. We'll do a little bit like our our fantasy football snake draft. We'll just mm-hmm. circle back around to you uh, with your number four. Um, who did you have going at number four? So I did put my number four at Cliff Eastwood. Uh, everything you said. Uh, All right. I didn't I didn't realize how many Agreed. of his older movies that he directed himself. You know, I didn't know that yeah. he did Outlaw Josie Wales. Um, but yeah, uh, Letters from You with Jamie Flags from Our Fathers, Million Dollar Baby. He's so yeah. versatile in, in what he can do, and it's he's just great. It, it's really, it is, it's always nice to see those guys that are former big Hollywood actors and then transition to behind the camera and sustain the success. You know, mm, you saw it with for 70 years. Yeah, I know. Right. And yeah. then <laughs> you, know, you saw it with Mel, I mean, Mel Gibson doing Braveheart and then he had that mm. whole anti-Semitic rant going on and mm. who knows what he could have done if, if, uh, if he hadn't done that <laughs> and maybe it would have just been braveheart there's been plenty of uh actors that have gone behind the camera for sean penn has done that you know once or twice yeah i, I didn't um, like apocalypto i didn't like apocalypto either yeah. i was i was a little disappointed by that well, one um y- I, sorry <laughs> that's um you know about clint eastwood though he uh he's been doing it since the 70s steadily non-stop right. directing movies yeah, and yeah. uh he, he's yeah, pretty much yeah, the opposite of neil breen like he does everything he writes it he directs it he produces it he stars <laughs> in it and it's amazing and everybody mm-hmm. agrees it's, his movies are amazing that's that's true you except know? for uh, uh, the meal that maybe was kind of lame <laughs> he, he has yeah I, I actually didn't end up getting to see that one but yeah he's he's had a couple he's had a few minor duds as every director has uh gary how about you uh i'm sorry i uh, won't well, sorry next to ian uh ian you're okay. uh i got sergio leone oh nice. yeah speaking of clint eastwood yeah i was about uh, to say yeah <laughs> thinking of where he got his start let's talk yeah. to the, the guy that was his godfather basically <laughs> yeah you know like he only has very few movies but they are just incredible they're right definitely some of the best movies ever made uh and talking about pacing earlier and what i was saying about kubrick you know he's like kubrick in in which case he's very very slow paced but at the same time it's so action or not action packed but really uh, even though it's so slow and there's no dialogue it's it's um it's like a thriller kind of i don't know the word i'm looking for but um you know, it like keeps you on the edge of your seat. Like in Once Upon a Time in the West, Tense. like the, there's no dialogue right. for the first 30 minutes and it's all one scene. And it's just these guys just sitting around and you just feel the tension. Like like you hear that yeah. fly that's just bugging the guy and stuff. And mm-hmm. and then finally the, the guy shows up that they're waiting for and he just kills them all like real real quick, you know? So um, he he's... Uh, a bit outside of the box, but as well, you know, he, he uh, does something different and just, but he's got, he's got his, his classics, the ones that he hit on though. Yeah. I mean, he knocked him out of the park, you know, yeah, they say that, that the big, the, the most intense intentions are conveyed, not through dialogue and words, mm-hmm. but just through ge- yeah, exactly. gestures and, and yeah, uh, good, bad, the emoting with from the, your face with the, um, the main shootout at the end. Like that was so amazing. Mm-hmm. Or in um, f- uh, for a few dollars more, where where the guy just comes up to the guy at the bar and he lights a match on the back of his head, and you think some shit's about to go down, but they're about to rob a bank, so they can't f- fuck him up. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gary, how about you? Number four. Uh, my number four is going to be uh, um, uh, Stanley Kubrick. I think that. Uh, okay. The, oh, as I said before, like, yeah, he's got just such a, a, a beautiful eye for how he tells stories, like just really in like intense detail and it's such a wide range too. I mean, you've got Dr. Strangelove to uh full metal jacket sure, and like just that, um, I mean, yeah, he just draws you in and the, his pacing and the 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 way he the style he chooses to tell it is is also different and unique it really is colorful and stands out and has some flavor yeah it is isn't it and you know i i actually didn't have him on my top five and i really actually i did struggle with it you know i know we had when we had the first episode uh ian and i debated 
about him <laughs> being the best of all time. And and I, I do like Kubrick a lot. I think that I, I talked about 2001 A Space Odyssey. I thought was just super slow and I didn't like the intention behind it. I thought they failed to convey it fully, but it's still it's still a good movie. Um, but it was hard for me. He honorable mention of mine. I just wanted to mm-hmm. say that because you had you had brought him up and I didn't want to pay disrespect to him or anything. Um, my number four was was a, a little out there, too. Um, but my number four was David Fincher. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because David Fincher, between, I mean, he's even done movies that you didn't know that he did. You know, even outside of basically producing and all, directing almost every episode of the first two seasons of House of Cards, mm-hmm. which is one of the best first two seasons of a drama series ever. He created that too, didn't um, he? He was one of the creators, yeah. right? Well, he, that's what I'm saying. He's one of the producers and directors yeah. and created it. Um, I mean, he had he had seven, Fight Club, Zodiac, Social Network, um fuck what else was um gone girl panic room which is really underrated that was a jodie foster movie uh with jared leto from back in the day and what i like about david fincher is i've always thought he's one of the most well-rounded directors in hollywood um if you look at every one of his movies he has what someone like ian might like he is very vivid color palettes Mm -hmm. and he always has a different he always has a different color to symbolize a different mood for each character and like fight club had a very different palette from seven Mm -hmm. and social network was very different from panic room and so forth um he's been very good at that his editing is is not quite on the level of scorsese and tarantino but pretty damn close and uh He's just he's he's just a very good storyteller. I think he's probably the most well-rounded director in Hollywood that's currently at the top of their game. I say within the last decade and a half, I can't think of anybody that's just more well-rounded. Mm-hmm. Certainly people that do things better, but as far as being well-rounded, and I don't think he's done yet. He's only like 58. So, okay. we'll see him for another two decades, I would say with uh, some with some classics coming out. So, that's my number 4. Um What's Let's, your number three? Yeah, I guess we'll have to go with my number three. We'll do that snake draft still. Uh, my number three, this kind of starts jumping into, you know, the normal ones you would think of. Uh, Spielberg is actually my number three. OK, um, I have him a little further down on the list. I don't need to go into what we talked about him being a master of staging and blocking and how much that can translate into success and convey an emotion through a scene. The one thing I love about Spielberg is if you've ever noticed And it was something I was watching the other day, and I just I've just noticed in particular. You look at Saving Private Ryan, Jurassic Park. um, You can look at Jaws. Really, any of his films. He was the director that made the zoom in on your face popular when you realize something was going on. He was the one that made it mainstream. Alfred Hitchcock was the one that started to do it first, but the one who made it mainstream in almost every movie that he did over and over again, he would zoom in when the main protagonist has something monumental or super despairing happen to them. And he would zoom in slow, hold it. And then this is what I was talking about casting earlier. Mm -hmm. He casts it perfectly for actors that can go to Ian's point from earlier can emote without dialogue. Mm-hmm. They can get their feelings and emotion across without saying anything, mm-hmm. just looking at the camera. He cast it perfectly. He he found one of the, the best shots in, in history and then um, made that popular mm-hmm. itself. And and I, I love him for that. I think his pre-2000 is when he was really good, but uh, I could go on a tangent for him all day, but uh, I'll leave that open. So, Gary, you're number three. Uh, my number three is Alfred Hitchcock. Um, yeah, that's another honorable yeah, mention for me. I didn't I mean, have him in my top five. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock, I think, uh, you know, Psycho, of course, is really famous for a window. Uh, Vertigo has just a beautiful color palette. I, I think that he really was mastered the thriller um, and suspense for people. And I think that's uh, really opened up a lot of interesting avenues for directors to take that they hadn't taken before that. And I think that, uh, you know, he's really got the the pulse of those down really well. Right, right. Uh, Ian, how about you? Number three. I uh, I mean, you're all mentioning really good ones, uh, some of the best, and some of them are better than my guys, but my guys mean more to me. So um, Sure, I, it's I, subjective. I, so yeah, I gotta go with the Coen brothers. They are... Um, Absolutely, good pick. Either Joel or Ethan, whoever, they're, they're great. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, like... W- specifically like uh, i mean opposite of what we were talking about with uh the pacing of kubrick and sergio leone that they're uh 
their pacing is really good and their dialogue is just the best um they they could take an or, most of their films are somewhere uh a small town in the middle of nowhere is real it should be really boring very slow very uh dull very but rural they, areas yeah, yeah but they make it so entertaining and just like the more dull it's supposed to be the more entertaining it ends up being and um you, you know what i mean like w- with uh the dialogue right. with the music uh everything like that they just kind of i guess make everything just more entertaining than it really has any right to be and then where Mm. uh (laughs) what's also great is their use of uh repeating dialogue you you know like in every movie there's a line that's repeated over and over again and uh and it's just funny every time and um Mm. And also, they do different genres. Like you have, uh, like yeah, they're a good genre. Spy comedy and Big Lebowski, and then you have uh, uh, like a total com, like Looney Tunes and Raising Arizona, and then in um, Blood Simple, you have a really slow paced Who Done It kind of thing, uh, which is breaks the rules of that mm-hmm. because you you see what happens but the characters don't know what's happening and you're just like following the characters trying to figure out what's going on, even though you know what's going on, which adds to the suspense. And so, yeah, so they're, they're sure. very unique is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. Neil, how about you? Who's your number three? Uh, so for me, my number three is kind of along the lines of, of David Fincher, but uh, I'm going to go with Wes Anderson. Uh, oh, I know you love Wes Anderson. I do Anderson, love Wes yeah. Anderson, uh, <laughs> but he also, like, each film has its own color palette. You know, Life Aquatic is heavy on the blues. Um, Grand Budapest is heavy, like, purple hues. But not only does yeah, that, yes. does he have really good comedic timing, um, he's very versatile in the fact that he does, like, stop motion with Fantastic Mr. Fox, mm-hmm. and he also does animation with, like, Isle of Dogs. He's just a very versatile director. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's yeah. Real, you know what I've noticed too about ever because I I was I was I was looking him up today. Just he wasn't really in my top ten, but he's I, I know you like him, and he is good. Um, I, how all of his all of his pictures are symmetrical. Every frame is is almost completely symmetrical. Like I was looking at one photo where Ray Fines is in that little purple. Uh, uh, I guess the bellboy the hotel, or, yeah, yeah, the bellboy or hotel manager, or whatever, it was. whatever yeah. it was. Yeah. And he's standing at the, the desk at the grand Budapest and he's got one lamp on each side and like every row of keys to the rooms, there's like five in the top right and five in the exact same spot in the top left. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, it was just the attention to detail on that was, I had never noticed that before. Um, and that was very impressive. I, yeah. the, you know, the, the dedication to that is, is, is quite cool. Um, so let's jump back to you. Who is your number two? Uh, so for me, number two is going to be Quentin Tarantino. Uh, he is just oh, yeah. an amazing storyteller, uh, great writer. Uh, he's got great timing in his, in his films. His his audio is always on par. His soundtracks are are amazing. Um, I think he is just just one of those great storytellers of our times. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, Ian, how about you? Same Tarantino, yeah, absolutely. It's that's, um, that's 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 really funny, actually. Be I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> uh, Gary, how about you? Let's let's. My number two is Tarantino. Oh as my well. god, my number two is Tarantino yeah. as well. I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, like for me, like Tarantino, he's uh, <laughs> Tarantino. He's so he's so good at. Uh, building a story that just draws you in. And even though it may, it may be recycled, you know, it, it feels shiny and new. And the way he, the way he tells the story is yeah. always the exciting part. Like, um, he jumps around, like, you know, you think of like, uh, Pulp Fiction, um, or Reservoir Dogs, like he jumps around and builds really nicely to the conclusion. Um, and I, I, the, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was not, my favorite of his, but uh, my least favorite. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like, and like he usually, except for that one really delivers on what you're looking for. Like, uh, you know, uh, I, I, he's great. 
That's and his dialogue so good. Just it is. That that's the screenwriting portion too yeah. for him, you know, is and that's 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 great that he's able to do to do that. And, Ian, go ahead. Yeah, just the way like I mentioned earlier, he he takes old things that have been done. Yeah, you know, old kung fu movies, classics, right? old black exploitation movies, old car chase movies, World War Two movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, he takes yeah. everything that like he grew up watching because he 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 he's like us guys as an accomplished filmmaker pretty much you know sure. like he, he is the yeah. ultimate fan of film and just recreates it recycles it um yeah he, he's just incredible like that the form that uh that i for me at least and i i think honestly i would i i challenge you guys to find somebody who's better as far as as far as perfect perfection in editing for his films mm. i don't think anybody is better than tarantino for, i really don't yeah. for me it's his tone like he like it's so differentiated and suited for whatever he's telling the story like you think about um the scene the fight at the end of kill bill volume one that's in sort of that snow covered uh place with uh, the garden Lucy in Luke. the back yeah. Yeah, yeah and you've got that little duck thing this or the, the water the bamboo water thing that's kind of right. just and then, uh, you know, you, you think about an, another movie he did. Pacing. Yeah. Like, it. Well, like it, it just looks and feels like the story it's trying to tell, tell right. really, really well. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, it, it's I think you'd be hard pressed to find a better paced movie than Kill Bill Volume 1. Uh, really Pulp Fiction. And uh, I thought Inglorious Bastards as well was also because um, it, it, it's hard to I, I say with the dialogue, um, Tarantino is probably I mean, the Coen brothers are up there for sure. I mean, e Eaton Cohen, he's normally the screenwriter with the two of them, but I would agree with Ian. They're certainly up there, too. But I would say he's probably my favorite screenwriter for that style of that style of film. But I just I don't know if I could throw the script into how if that makes you a good director because mm -hmm. there's kind of two different two different things yeah. so i'd be conflicted on that anyways um so so my number one in general you could guess is martin scorsese mm. um and but he doesn't like to go on just, location scouting because it's too bumpy he it's too bumpy, it's too bumpy. <laughs> uh, really? gary and i were watching <laughs> we were watching a, a master class from martin scorsese it took us about 18 hours altogether we watched it over like two days it's a long, um, long movie. and martin scorsese was talking about how to create a film and one of the things he was saying was make sure when you go location scouting get a location scout so you don't have to go he was like i hate taking drives through rural country roads because the roads are so bumpy and it makes me nauseous and he just complained about it for like three minutes and he's like this you know this old 75 year old geezer sitting in a chair yep. and we just were laughing really yep. hard and we're like why is this a point of contention yeah. in the in in the master class yeah. why we're are you like, talking you about directed this? taxi really yeah really <laughs> Well, taxi driver yeah um but if you if you go back my favorite thing for him um you know pacing is always good his soundtracks are always memorable maybe it's because i grew up listening to the type of music that he puts in um but he pays homage to every era that he directs and he's actually the opposite of tarantino you don't see him pay homage to old school cinema cin uh, cinematic filmmakers he pays homage to society and that's actually something that's not done very often with directors from the 80s to the 2000s i guess um everything is very by the book there's there's no like um uh, what is that like a red herring or something where they or like an easter egg excuse me they throw they throw like something random in there and they're like oh if you pay really close attention you can see the starbucks drink uh in in that scene in game of thrones and it pays homage to this thing i think that was an accident but you, yeah. you get what i mean yeah. um he stays true 100 percent the attention to detail like wes anderson uh the accuracy um it's it's all historically accurate in every one of his movies but his biggest thing for me is the long running shots which were really made famous in tv if you'd watched west wing in the 90s they did this a lot but tarantino in goodfellas in gangs of new york in particular mm -hmm. and uh, wolf of wall street scorsese Scorsese, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just saying most people would know it if they haven't, if yeah. they're not terribly familiar with Scorsese, they would have seen it in West Wing okay. in the 90s because they, they did that. But the long 
one camera track shots. Um, Birdman kind of copied it too, the Michael yeah. Keaton movie a couple years ago. Um, but if you watch Gangs of New York, Wolf of Wall Street, and uh, Raging Bull, I guess, had it a little, but Goodfellas in particular. The amount of time it takes to coordinate and precisely time 50 actors moving in and out of each other and in front of the camera and nobody tripping over each other and making it look as natural as possible that i think is the that is the final that's the epitome of where you want to be that is the upper echelon of where you want to be as a filmmaker you had talked about gary you want a director to be able to bring the audience into the movie and make them Mm -hmm. feel like they're experiencing the same thing as the characters. Nothing puts me into the movie more than, than, than cuts. You know, when I see a cut in between shots, I'm like, Oh wait, I'm, I'm, I'm still here in real life because there's this difference. There's a different, a different angle, Uh but if it's just one continuous shot, you feel like you're the person walking through that restaurant or Mm -hmm. walking through the streets of old Harlem or whatnot and scorsese has mastered that over you know decades of filmmaking and i think that's very special and that's why he was my number one i i don't remember the name of the guy that did 1917 but that Uh, movie was oh my god phenomenal yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah, it it really was um yeah hats off to him but he should give hats off to scorsese and his dp because they were credited in goodfellas with being the first ones to do it for more than five seconds really so Mm, yeah okay yeah that, that that's what they said i mean i've never seen another movie before goodfellas that yeah, had that continuous right. shot yeah. um yeah because you have like those old like 50 50s and 60s movies where they'll like like singing in the rain had that you know when they're trying to dance in the studio and stuff they have like the dolly track where they they have the two people dancing and it's a big wide shot right but this yeah. is a this is a point of view shot is it what moves. i'm talking about like you feel like a you feel like the camera is like a person moving exactly. through a crowd Correct. Yeah, okay all and right it, it doesn't those old dolly track shots they were just pointed one direction and they couldn't they couldn't zigzag they couldn't move yeah. diagonally they couldn't well, the move camera up was or like down. a thousand pounds so it, tr- yeah. exactly yes yes and uh, took you know six people to operate nowadays it still takes a lot but not as many nowadays you can um, just wear glasses that have a camera on them and you get much higher true. resolution you know now they have easy rigs and cameras are lighter yeah um anyway so the, so scorsese was my number one um just because i love all of his films he's able to genre jump really easily he doesn't just do mafia films Mm -hmm. um you look at hugo wolf of wall street raging bull um he he's he's very versatile he can do a lot of stuff anyways my number one i'm sorry i'll stop rambling gary you're number one uh neil do you want to go i don't want to steal your pick i'm pretty sure we have the same pick (laughs) Okay. Um, (laughs) My number one is Steven Spielberg. Um, I think that, um, and as we kind of discussed in the last one, uh, since 2000 or so, he hasn't really done a whole lot of new kind of really impactful movies. But like, you know, you look at just his litany of movies from uh, like Indiana Jones, Jaws, uh, Jurassic Park, like Steven Spielberg to me is the embodiment of the, um, you know, the, the director, uh, you know, the, the modern director that makes, um, uh, big, uh, movies that people love and are highly entertaining. And, you know, I, I, I think he's just great. He's, he's my number one pick. Yeah. 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 It's a good one. Thank Ian, you. how about you? Who's your number one? Even though I can probably guess. Well, well, I mean, yeah, we, we already know Stanley Kubrick, but since I already said that before, I, I would cheat and throw Scorsese in there. <laughs> You can't cheat. You can't cheat. You just I said just Kubrick. Did. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, just did. Did, 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 Okay. So then Kubrick doesn't make your top five? That's sad. <laughs> I mean, you gotta redo, does. No, no, man. Now you got to redo your entire top nope. five list. <laughs> um, I mean, they're tied for number one. Yeah, tied for number one. There you go. Uh, because okay. I mean, as much as I love Kubrick, I, I love Chris Hazy and everything you said about Chris Hazy, yeah. I absolutely agree with. He, he is like his, his movies are just so enjoyable, and uh, yeah. So I mean, he, really he has to he has to be up there. Absolutely, uh, Neil. You said that your number one was it's Steven Spielberg, Spielberg for all the reasons we talked about, but basically <laughs> just because he was the director of my childhood. Like every movie I remember yeah. as a kid, it was him. You know, Hook. A lot of people forget that he did oh, Hook. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, all the Indiana Jones. You know, Jaws. Uh, those are what I grew up with, and he just a plus. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. just yeah. It, man. It's always so strange how. Oh, it's not strange. It's it's fun just how the nostalgia factor really 
tips our opinion in a certain direction, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, yeah, you know, you're totally right. I didn't I didn't even think about Spielberg just directing all of those movies when I was a kid and all of my favorites as a kid. That's a really good point. I didn't even I know that he did, but I just never thought about it. Like, it's never occurred to me to think about that, that uh, that frame of mind. So, yeah, good pick. Um, okay, so I, I do uh, hear it towards towards the end here. We're wrapping up. So I, I wanted to jump into um, a collective Mount Rushmore of greatest directors of all time. Uh, see if we can come up with one. OK, uh, and let's see if we can agree. Uh, if one person does not agree, we have to we will have to kick that person out. So okay. feel free to debate amongst yourselves. Um, I'm just going to let you guys, we don't have to rank them. Yeah. We just pick five. Well, I mean, just based on like how, like the conversation went, I think Spielberg would be on there. sounds like Tarantino would be on there. Um, Spielberg and Tarantino seem to be, and Scorsese seem to be the only ones that. I I don't I think a lot of people say Clint Eastwood. We had mentioned. That was, there were a lot of honorable mentions, but I think only, I I think only Johnny had him. Like he was 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 in the top five. He was, no, oh, he yeah. was Neil's okay. number four. That's right. right. Um, so, okay. So we'll say we can all collectively, we can all collectively agree. Quentin Tarantino is in there mm-hmm. for sure. Cause we all had him up there. Yeah, number um, two. Does anybody have a problem with Martin Scorsese? I do. Fuck that guy. <laughs> okay. So no one has <laughs> yeah. a problem. We, he we, doesn't count. Yeah. We can no. do Scorsese. <laughs> okay. So Tarantino, Scorsese, Spielberg. Gotta have Spielberg on there. I say Spielberg's in. Okay. Ian? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I can't say no. It's cool. It's cool. Okay, right, fair enough. Hey, it's cool if you don't want to. I'm. This I mean, is totally up for debate. It's fine. His movies aren't my flavor, I guess you could say, right. but I do fully appreciate how great he is as a director. Sure, mm-hmm. sure. The re- re- as revolutionary has he's become. You know, he's made it cool to be the mainstream commercialized route. It almost seems which is kind of sad after 2000. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I would like to see him d- try some more movies. I mean, I'd he's like to old, see him try something new he... just something more. Well, I mean, he's, he's no. stepped back to doing more producing now than the director. Yeah. So. yeah. When you've I got the Dreamworks money, you just bankroll big. things. Yeah, that's right. I guess DreamWorks has been getting pretty big recently and they've been, they've been producing a lot of Oscar winners. Um, okay. So our, our top three, we got Scorsese, Tarantino and Spielberg are on that Mount Rushmore. Uh, let's carve out the last two spots. I'll let I, people throw some names out. Yeah, let's, I, let's go I think it's either got to be between Hitchcock or Kubrick. Or both. We got two spots left. I thought We no, got two spots left. Tarantino, Scorsese, and Spielberg are the only three people we have yeah, on there. So there are four yeah, people so on. Kubrick. But, but I'm, I, I know it's there's four oh, Mount Rushmore. Oh, we're doing Mount it's Rushmore. a top five, oh, okay. Gary. Oh, okay. Our <laughs> Mount Rushmore has one extra on there. I've always thought that four was stupid. I like five. It's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice number. It fits on your hands so well. It does. It does, Gary. <laughs> um, well, then, yeah, I, I would add both of those guys in. Hitchcock. And that and would be your round out, would be Kubrick and yeah. Hitchcock. Okay. Does anybody have a problem with those two? Uh, I got a problem with those two. I, I don't have a problem with both of them, but... I mean, that's I, what like I have a problem Kubrick, with those two <laughs> but I, I, I mean, I like... Uh, but I, I'm not going to put them on my top five. I don't... Maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Neil, who are you going to... Who are you going to... Um... <laughs> Hitchcock yeah, just, for me just he's he's a really good director, especially for his time. But I don't think he's on my route much for. Yeah, the father. I mean, he was the father of suspense. Don't get okay. me wrong. He's you know so, Psycho and Rear Window. All right, so Hitchcock's out, and uh, Neil, you said you disagree with Kubrick. No, I would put Kubrick on there. Okay, so we've got Kubrick on. So we need I, one more. I I can't. You can't. I can't in good conscience say say no to him. You're right. I mean, between the Shining, Spartacus. Even 2001 A Space Odyssey and Clockwork Orange that I I didn't care for those as much as most other people did, um, but I still liked them. Mm-hmm. I mean, he also um, has Doctor Strange love. I mean, you know, they're going to see the big board. They're going to see Strange the big board. Yeah, our if, precious bodily see, fluids. I, I love, I I think as far as aesthetic, as far as aesthetic, aesthetic movies go now and the visual medium, I think Chris Nolan is at the top of the pack. But again, but Chris Nolan, he, he you're right. What yeah. I'm going to say is he paid homage and he learned yeah. and took from Kubrick. You're yeah. right. So I got you got to pay respect to the uh, the OGs. So, OK, I'll put Kubrick uh, in top. Five. And you okay. should uh, right. check out a movie called Barry Lyndon. Uh, not very many people have seen that one that came out between. I feel like you've talked. Uh, yeah, I, I did. Actually. Um, it, it's, it's very slow paced, but it's so unique in which 
case every shot is a a painting and it's made that right. way and um mm-hmm. all indoors all the lighting is by candlelight it's uh it's a very unique movie right right okay well let's check it out um okay so we've got spielberg tarantino kubrick scorsese and we need one more well i'm gonna throw in uh, clint eastwood just because of how long he's been doing it and how how many amazing films he's done how successful or, or how about sergio leone okay sergio leone is another one is i mean technically eastwood got his start from that uh who else let's let's throw some names in and then we'll debate them here in a second because the last spot is usually the is no 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 <laughs> you're uh, ian this is your last podcast yes. say goodbye to, say you, goodbye yeah. to, say goodbye to all of our listeners and the free, free say, publicity say good night gracie uh, good night gracie it was worth it <laughs> it was worth it for the neil breen comment no um oof yeah you know um uh, i had you know i i have I've got I've got Fincher in my top five, but I I don't think I'd be able to convince yeah. you guys on that one. Um, and I, and he's not he just hasn't been doing it long enough, even though he's one of my personal favorites. Oof. I, uh, and Gary, you know Hitchcock is still a good one. Yeah. Um, I don't think I could convince y'all on Frank Capra. Uh, not not. I don't know. I mean, not necessarily. Um, I mean, uh, there's also Francis Ford Coppola. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, yeah. Godfather. Oh, you man, know? I completely yeah. forgot about that guy. That yeah. guy's great. Um, so there's a couple. Mm-hmm. I, I personally, just based off of all of the movies that I've seen from Clint Eastwood in the last 35 years when he started directing in the 80s. Um, 70s, actually. I would... What was he? I don't. I'm pretty sure it was the 80s. Actually, he I was mean, acting in the 70s, but I don't remember him directing anything. I, I just he looked was at in, his IMDb before we started this. Yeah, like he did Outlaw right. Josie Wales in 76. Uh, he did a couple other mm-hmm. ones before then, going back to 71. He direct. He directed those though. He he wasn't just a producer or an actor in it. Correct. It says directed by. I would be willing okay. to put Clint Eastwood on my Mount Rushmore. Okay. I, I my I, five person Mount Rushmore. <laughs> <laughs> I would be I would be willing to put him on on my, in my top five. Okay. I'd, I'd put I'd put Clint Eastwood in there. Um, Ian, are you good with him? Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Okay. okay. All right. So our Mount Rushmore is Steven Spielberg, Tarantino, um, Martin Scorsese, Martin Scorsese, uh, Clint Eastwood, mm-hmm. and uh, Stanley Kubrick. Stanley, Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick. Okay. Yeah. That's our that's our our Mount Rushmore plus one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's our five. The big five. The big they call five. them the Fab Five. Yep. You the know? Fab Four. Everything should have been four, Johnny. Everything God damn it. Four. It's your lucky number. <laughs> it fits so nicely on your hand. There are four people on this podcast. <laughs> There's no reason it's so not to great. do four. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> let's jump in really quick. Uh, I do want everybody to, uh, since we're wrapping up here, I did want to go over really quick. Um, if everybody wanted to throw out maybe an underrated director uh, that they kind of thought maybe is currently not getting enough love or wasn't getting enough praise back in the day. Um, hell, maybe they didn't get enough praise for their earlier work and now they're doing really great. It's up to you. However you want to do it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'll go ahead and start just, uh, since I've already got a couple up here anyways. If you say that guy that directed, uh, hereditary, I'm going to be so mad. Ari Aster. No, I will. I promise I will not be talking about Ari Aster. No. Um, although I, 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 People keep arguing with me about it, so I'm always willing to give things a second chance and admit I'm wrong. If I'll, I, I'll go agree. see another movie of his, but I'll watch Her- that- I'll watch Hereditary again. Yeah. I'm not watching Midsummer again. That no, I'm not that watching was again. God I'll awful. watch Hereditary again. I mean, it was a scary movie. It scared the crap out of me. It just wasn't good. It was um, scary that I paid money to watch that. Yeah. No, you were scared by Hereditary. You were jumping in your seat. Mm-hmm. You were absolutely jumping. Don't well, lie, is that the Gary. one that had the. Where she's the, like the, sawing the her head, head off with a yeah. piece of floss or something that was disgusting like that was creepy as fuck yeah. i mean like yeah <laughs> yeah okay. that was crazy that it was it was a very scary film i will give it that i just didn't like the story um for me underrated directors um i i I, I'm, I'm not going to go into the whole James Wan spiel like I normally do. I feel like at this point, he's finally he did Aquaman, got a lot of really good reviews off that. He did uh, Furious 7. He's finally starting to get recognition outside of his horror films, which people have heard of, but a lot of people actually haven't seen. Um, you'd be surprised at how many people have not seen The Conjuring, have not seen Insidious or the original Saw. Um, or they're like, oh, I saw it as a teenager. 
I've noticed that a lot of people when they say they saw a movie as a teenager don't really remember the movie. They remember two scenes from it and, mm-hmm. and that's it. Um, and it's different when you see it as an adult. So, you know, I always thought I've always thought James Wan is the next Alfred Hitchcock, but you guys know my feelings on that. He didn't even I, make the mountain. He did. He didn't. <laughs> but he's he's still got a, he's young. So he's still got a while to go. Um, but I'm going to say Christopher Nolan, and I'm going to explain why really fast. All right. I'm going to explain why. OK, um, <laughs> that was my I, thought, <laughs> yeah, you I understand did, that. You defend your bad choice. And I'm, but I'm going to defend it if you'll allow me to speak. <laughs> All right, cool, um, cool. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, with him. He's overrated when you give him a movie that is not in his his wheelhouse necessarily. Christopher Nolan is very good at taking a very convoluted and confusing storyline and turning it into something that people can appreciate and follow, with the exception of Tenet. Okay, Tenet is the exception. It, so yeah, um, Interstellar, Memento in particular, um, Inception. Those three prestige. in particular are just, uh, you know what? Prestige wasn't, I didn't really con- think it was that confusing. Yeah, I always I mix that you, one you up know? with the other one. The other one you're thinking of is The Illusionist yeah. with Edward Norton yeah. Yeah, and Paul Giamatti. That, both very good movies. Um, but Chris Nolan, when he's got uh, most of those stories, they are visually stunning and pleasing. And he's very good at that, as I've already claimed. But he's really good at... At, at, he's really good at, at the storytelling in general. And, he, and those mo- those stories are actually driven by the storyline. They're not driven by the action elements. They're not driven by the the visual effects. Tenet, Dunkirk, were both driven by those visual effects. We're both driven by the war element. They were driven by action scenes, mm. you know. And, and it, it, when it, he does that and yeah. he gets the movie to do that and he gets all this hype coming before it, those are the times that he fails. And so I think his movies that we give him, his movies that we don't, we don't talk about much, those are the ones we should be giving him credit for. Um, people talk about The Dark Knight and they talk about Inception. And, you know, they talked about some people loved Dunkirk and they thought Tenet was going to be great. But his best movies are not those. They're what, Ian, what you just recommended, The Prestige, Memento, which was his second film that actually got uh, he got anything. Interstellar, which I think people don't talk about. Batman Begins, the first Batman. Those are his, his deepest storylines that really connect you. And I don't think people pay much attention to it. They think of him as this visually, uh, this visually pleasing director that's, you know, it just just kind of like going going the route of Michael Bay. He's kind of like treading the line between a Michael Bay and a Stanley Kubrick, it seems at some point. And I don't think he should be there. I think he needs to take a step back, take movies that maybe take a little less money on the budget and less star power and go back to what started him, where he was from at the beginning. That's where he's really good. And mm. I think that part of his I think he's very underrated in that aspect. Um, sorry, it took me a little yeah. bit to get around there. But that's what I believe. So, uh, Neil, I want to jump to you. Who was who was uh, your underrated director? Uh, I think um, an underrated director that I really like is Alfonso Cuaron. He's okay. the one who directed sure. Children yeah. of Men, uh, oh, yeah. Gravity. But a lot of people don't know he also directed Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. The best one in the series. <laughs> um, he's, you know, he does a lot of Mexican film because he's from Mexico. He's from Mexico City, but, yeah. <laughs> but the, the things he does, you know, in English, are, are, I always think are just amazing. So I think yeah. he's not, you know, he's underrated in the fact that I wish people would give him more opportunities to, you know, sure. make some stuff. Absolutely. Because he's, and, and it's funny, you know, you ha- I had seen him a couple times today too. And it's funny you brought up Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Nobody, yeah, it, I mean, did anybody remember that he directed that until, like, today I read that, and then, Neil, you mentioned that, but I wouldn't, if you had, somebody had came up to me and said, hey, who directed this? I'd be like, I don't fucking know. It was one of the better Harry Potter movies, but I don't remember. Yeah, you know, I just, I think, I just think totally he does right. very yeah. well at, at, at uh, storytelling. Uh, yeah. Especially, like, Children of Men, his, his cinematography, whoever he was working <laughs> with on that one was amazing. Uh, yeah, that that one scene in the, going through the building. with the car. Yeah. yeah, that was cool. And that's that's, that's the same thing. The Scorsese yeah. follow that I was talking about yeah. is that one camera. Um, God, man, and Children of Men might be. And I think when we did uh, we talked about scariest movies of all time. Neil, I think that was your pick, right, yeah. for for the scariest movie, because that is fucking scary. I mean, if we can't reproduce 
well, that's the end of humanity in 70 years <laughs> or 80 years, you know? Um, and Ian, what about you? It's oh, children, children of Men is set, uh, I think, like five years from now, just so you know. So the clock is ticking. That's right. Oh, my God. That's right. That is fucking nerve wracking. <laughs> uh, Ian, how about you? What was your who's your underrated director? You want to hear something funny? I Always. was going to say Clint Eastwood, but never mind. <laughs> why? Wait, what? Oh, oh, for underrated. I was, I was thinking yeah. overrated just for a second. I don't know why. <laughs> we have all never mind because he's on the Mount Rushmore now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. It was your, uh, who's your underrated, though? Uh, so, yeah, with, without him, uh, I, I would huh. say uh, a director named Jack Hill, who um, okay. he's not the most he underrated, done? but uh, he, he's one of my favorites. Uh, he definitely had an influence on uh, Tarantino. He did uh, um, Coffee, Foxy Brown, Spider Baby, a bunch of old black exploitation movies. Um, have, have any of y'all seen Coffee or Foxy Brown? Foxy Brown, I've seen. I haven't seen Coffee though. I yeah. drank some coffee. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, that th- Coffee and Foxy Brown. The, the, they're the movies that put Pam Greer and you know gave her a real career. She already had a career, but it, like really made her like cult status. And then uh, it's what made Tarantino take a, a book that was not even called Fox or Coffee or Fuck. <laughs> Hold on. Are you trying to tell me that Pam Jackie Greer Brown. played both Foxy Brown and Jackie Brown? Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, Jackie Brown was a book, uh, like a who done it kind of spy thriller kind of thing. Then he took he took Pam Greer, changed the name of the book to Jackie Brown as a uh, homage to Foxy Brown and Coffee, and it's all like because of Jack Hill and. Um, and Jack Hill, he influenced a lot of directors today uh, with, with his old black exploitation movies. And I mean, he, he's definitely the best black exploitation guy. And I, I'm a big fan of those movies and uh, Grindhouse movies. Uh, so pretty much, yeah, he, he, if you want like old, uh, gritty, exploitive, fun, uh, you know, movies about uh, you know, killing drug dealers in the streets and cleaning up the streets and stuff like that. That's your guy. Okay. All right. All right, Gary. How about you? Uh, mine is going to be Sam Raimi. Um, he's uh, he directed. He started off in the seventies uh, directing. Uh, you know, The Evil Dead, which was a really popular uh, cult classic Hell movie yeah. nowadays. Yeah, um, you should watch Hail to the Dead. Yeah, and uh, he did my favorite movie, Spider Man Two. Um, and there, Good you, you were talking earlier in this podcast, Johnny, about uh, the the shot staying on someone after they finish speaking and somebody else reacts. Yeah. There's, I remember distinctly when Spider Man Two came out, and I was watching it in the movie theaters. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a part in it where Peter Parker is telling Aunt May that he's responsible for Uncle Ben dying, and Mm. You know, it, it just, it stay, the camera stays on Peter, um, as Aunt May is doing her line. Just, it, it's just this mo- wonderful moment. I remember thinking, don't cut away, don't cut away. And it didn't cut away. And yeah, I think that, um, people think about him, uh, kind of as like a, oh, just a real, you know, cheap and cheesy kind of director, like the evil dead, mm-hmm. but it, like, he's also good with comedy, like his, uh, Army of Darkness uh, is a really funny movie um, and just kind of continues the um, Ash story. So uh, I, I think he's underrated and I love Sam Raimi. And he, I also love all the stuff he does. I, I, I bet you do. You do talk about him a lot. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, he's he's also these are all really good picks. You know, they, I, and it's funny. You you think you're like, oh, they're all they're millionaires. They make a lot of famous movies. But would we consider a lot of these people in the upper echelon of A-list directors and on the likes of who is on our Mount Rushmore? Probably not. They'd probably mm-hmm. be a tier below. And uh, who knows? Maybe they haven't gotten enough credit. Maybe someday 
they will be up in that upper echelon. Mm-hmm. Uh, so really quick, I do want to, before we wrap up for the week, I do want to uh, hear everybody's recommendations for up and coming directors. Um, if you've got uh, one in particular that you really like, maybe somebody that is just new to the scene or they've been around and they just recently came out with something big that they, that they got their name recognition from. Um, uh, so I, I will go ahead and we'll just round it back around to Gary. Uh, Gary, who do you think? Who would you recommend? Who should people be checking out? Um, I'm I'm really excited uh, for Robert Eggers. Eggers, maybe. Okay. Um, he directed uh, The Vavitch and The Lighthouse, uh, which is a Willem Dafoe movie that came out kind of recently. Okay. Um, and I, those are, I think, the only two movies he's done. And okay. I'm, I'm curious to see where he's going to go because The, the Vavitch... Or the witch. It's as, just the witch. But <laughs> have, you, have you seen? Have you seen either of those movies? Yeah, you have. Yeah, I thought you would have hated those. Both of them. Well, I, I've not, seen both, and they're just like out of. They're like they're on the level of like Ari Aster's like Hereditary. They they're that slow. Like they, they're that type of horror movie that yeah. They I hate mean, normally. I mean, like it's. But I think that. Um, like especially with the lighthouse, which I think was his uh, more recent movie. It was just like a year ago. Yeah. Um, Two it, years. It's interesting to see how, like, because it was kind of like with uh, you were talking about with uh, Christopher Nolan, how uh, he's really good at getting the people like the emotional content. Sure. I, I think that um, he he may he may fizzle out and not be any good, but I, I think he's he's somebody that uh, I'd watch as an up and coming director because because uh-huh. especially since he's he seems like he's not afraid to take chances like, uh, you know, the lighthouse was filmed in a um a uh, a square aspect ratio and black and white uh-huh. um and you know that you know seems to me to i like directors that take chances like I, that's like tarantino does that a lot uh sure. you know hitchcock uh kubrick like all, all the all the directors we named uh-huh. really do that and so uh he he's gonna be my uh my stock to watch if, if you can't get uh gamestop check out some robert eggers eggers I, I can't tell you how incredibly floored I am right now that he was your pick. Did you pick him? No, no, no. no. Neil, did you pick no, him? No, no, no. <laughs> I, no. I, I, Gary, I've been watching movies with you for almost 20 years at this point, and this guy, the style that he directs in is mm-hmm. literally what you hate when you go see films, so I'm mm-hmm. just shocked that you like both of them. Um, well, and they're not like my favorite films, but okay. what, what, I, what oh. I'm saying is I think like he has potential because maybe if the script's a little bit different, but like just the difference in those two. It was fil- his pacing. It wasn't yeah. the script. <laughs> but like just, just the difference in the way those two films came out like okay. visually and how they felt. Um, I think that show is showing that he's maybe got a broad range. Sure. So okay. I'm, I'm hopeful that that'll develop into something, mm-hmm. but yeah, th- those are not my, those are not my favorite movies by sure. No, no, I, I know. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that's, that is certainly an interesting one. I wasn't expecting that. So cool. Good on, good on you. Way to branch out. Um, Ian, how about you? Who is, who is your up and coming director? Y'all are, you're going to recommend everyone. I am going to butcher his name. He uh, okay. he's from New Zealand. Uh, Taika Waititi. Waititi. God damn it! I should not have let you gone first. Holy <laughs> shit! Are you kidding me? That are you Neil's kidding choice. me? The Ian, that says <laughs> Ian is stealing mine. Ian is. St- Why does this happen to me? Why is it all? Hey, this happened on Ian's podcast two weeks ago uh, when we were doing the review on the Warriors, and I was going to yeah. pick Tarantino to redirect it, and your friend from Louisiana did it. Uh, Anyways, yeah. I'll just add on to what you say. So go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, he's great. Um, he's not. He is. I mean, he he's had a career for a while. Or if As he won, I, I could go with another one and a writer. I, I can say no, 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 no. This no, this is hilarious. You already Keep fucked going. him over. Keep going. Keep going, please. No, 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 it's fine. I've got I've got directors for days, so you know it's fine. Please, please. Um, no, Keep yeah, he, he's great. Jojo Rabbit was very amazing, and it's yeah. it's crazy that it's the guy who did what we do in the shadows and Thor Ragnarok, like those three movies are just so different from each other. I rewatched Thor Ragnarok uh, again about a week ago and I liked it better seeing it the second time. Actually, I was, I was surprised. I I was, I was okay with the guardians of the galaxy. It, it it just rubbed me the wrong way the first time I saw it. And then I watched it again. I was like, ah, it's on FX. I'll give it another shot. And I was, I was surprised at the end. I was like, okay, did that he, was not as bad as I remember. I don't think he did. Guardians. No, 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 no. We, no, he didn't. Uh, James Gunn did. Um, we were talking about uh, originally how we didn't like Thor Ragnarok as much as we liked uh, 
mm-hmm. what was the Thor, the first Thor, and, and then, then Thor Dark Dark World, Dark World, yeah. Um, just because they were very true to the original Thor mm. comics, and Ragnarok was two Guardians of the Galaxy comedy, and they were just ripping it's off a, Guardians yeah, of the Galaxy a because of how multiple f- comics too. Was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, I love that guy. He's uh, he surprised me. He he uh, surprised me too, man. And I think with him, one of my favorite things, something I haven't really seen very often, is you don't see um, visual comedy done anywhere you see you you see comedy you hear it slapstick is a little different visual comedy is the aesthetic of the scene being played the costuming um you look at jojo rabbit the length of uh hitler shorts and the (laughs) the type of mustache they used it it made it looked like him but it was certainly a spoof it was certainly a a farcical on uh on 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 the life of him and uh well i I think it's because that was like hitler as imagined it was imagined by right yeah yeah Yeah. and and um, the whole thing with the shoes too like that was just incredible yeah and so what what i'm getting to is that that kind of stuff has not been really attempted in the mainstream since Monty Python yeah. and their crew. And that's something that I really miss. You know, you know, I, you know, I haven't seen since, since John Cleese and um, uh, Terry Gilliam and those guys, you know, they were all, they were coming out with, you know, hit up, you know, life of Brian and Holy grail and just hit after hit flying circus and all that. And I've seen a new wave of that come from, uh, and being led by uh, Taika Waititi, uh, provided that I'm saying that correct. And uh, yeah, God, man, I think what we do in the shadows. Yeah, uh, and that just made me want to. I haven't watched the series yet. Oh, it's, but the it's movie really itself good. Was hilarious. Yeah, I've seen that multiple times um, just from recording on TV. I'll even sit through the commercials because mm-hmm. it's just it's so good. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, I don't care. Um. So yeah. So those. I guess so. Ian. Those were both of ours. Um, okay. <laughs> Neil. What about you? Or um. Yeah. yeah. Neil. Go, what, Neil. What about so you? So he's not really an up and comer. He's kind of been around for a while, but he hasn't really done much directing. And I really want to see him step out and do more directing. And I think John Krasinski is going to be a really good director oh. if, he's, if he takes a step out of uh-huh. out of acting and focuses on directing because i think quiet place was was a great film it was i haven't seen the second one i've heard you know decent reviews for it but i would like to Did it uh, come out yet uh yeah it came out last post- year i thought postponed because oh okay i thought they postponed because of covid uh, i think it came out i could be wrong but okay. you might be you might be but right. if uh, if he one. got the itch to to do some more directing i would definitely be on board for for following that yeah that's uh jim from the office right, yeah, right. okay right. Yeah. yeah okay um I guess since Ian so rudely took mine, uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, my, I did have a, I had a backup. Um, this one may not make a lot of sense. Um, Bong Joon Hoo, the guy who just directed Parasite, which won Best Picture. Um, outside of that, just being in general one of my favorite foreign films that I've ever seen, uh, and seen it in theaters like four different times. Uh, he also did a really good movie called Snowpiercer that I have just lived by for the last couple of years. And that was my first, that was his first English film. And that was my first um, look at him, you know, and I, I bring him up because he, he has only, he has only had that one Oscar and Snowpiercer didn't do super great at the box Snow office. Snowpiercer was... is such an underrated movie. Um, I know. Dude. Like it's not many so... people have seen it, but Chris Evans is amazing in that movie. He is, and it's just it's just stacked. They've got um Ed Harris, uh, God, Tilda Swinton, mm-hmm. and Eric yeah, Harris. Um, gosh, who's the guy that runs the back of the train? Uh, uh, Rich, not Richard Harris, but uh, he, not Michael Gambon. Um, he's a guy that looks like him. Uh, he's in 1984. Oh my God! Uh, dang it! Uh, he is. Oh, I found it. Uh, he is the man known as John Hurt. John That's Hurt who it was John yeah. Hurt played Gilliam. Um, you know, with with an with a director like that, um. A lot of times we don't see foreign directors from the foreign markets. We don't see them get popular very often with the English based films. And it was it was it was just nice to see, I guess, with Alfonso Cuaron, you know, that's that's a Guillermo del Toro. We see it with the with the the Mexican film market. We see that because they're you know, they're so close so they're able to migrate over to California a lot easier, um, I, I would guess. Um 
but yeah, we don't see it from the Asian market as much. You know, you see them from Europe, you see them from South South and Central America, North America, some, but you don't see it from Asia very often. And uh, and yeah, I mean, there's talent all around the world, and some we still haven't found yet. You know, uh, so it's 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 cool seeing that. And I've I've been wanting to watch a couple other films of his, but after I saw Snowpiercer and then I heard he came out with Parasite, I immediately went and saw it on like the second day it was in theaters and and just loved it. Um, so he would he would be my recommendation, I guess. So for uh, for our, our movie for the week. Do you guys want to do a movie for the week? I'm yeah, let's, throw one out let's there. just go yeah. ahead and do one. Let's yeah. just go ahead and do one. Just a um, quick one. Yeah, it can really be any any director at all. Um, I'm just going to go first since I was already talking about it. I'm going to recommend Snowpiercer since okay. we're just chatting about it, just to make it easier. Um, it's just basically this dystopian future where the world has frozen over. It was basically Austin last week. Yep. Um, oh, <laughs> and yeah. And there's this train that just runs. Uh, its, its engine is constantly running, and it has to run around a track that circles the Earth and... Uh, if it stops at any point, then everybody inside dies, but it's supposed to have the last remaining members of humanity living on earth. And there's different classes of society inside this train. And it's about a revolution that Chris Evans leaves from the people that are really poor at the back of the train to get to the very front of the train to take over everything. And uh, I won't go into any more because I don't want to spoil it. But uh, as Neil stated, a phenomenal performance from him and just a really fun movie to watch. Uh, Ian, what was your movie recommendation for the week for our listeners? This is a foreign movie and uh, with quite a director. Um, It's called The Tribe. Mm hmm. Um, it's about a, uh, a school for the deaf and all the dialogue is in sign language and there's no subtitles. Mm-hmm. There's no dubbing. It's all just sign language and it's in, uh, another country. So even if you know sign language in America, it, American sign language is definitely different from, uh, I don't even know which it's some country in Europe. So basically, the idea is that you're not supposed to understand what is being said, so you don't know uh-huh. what's going on. But the directing style is so good that you under you fi- you slowly figure out what's going on just as it happens. So you're on this journey. It's this new kid. He's uh he joins this new school for the deaf and like he is as new to this place uh as as we are the viewers so uh uh-huh. everything that ha- you, like you have no idea what's going on until it happens and then when it does it's like holy shit it, like shit goes crazy because it's a bunch of intense situations uh which i won't give anything away but uh other than he joins a gang which you find out later and then a okay. bunch of illegal criminal activities uh is a very adult film but it's just so unique in a way uh where uh you just have to watch it and figure out what's going on until when it does happen it's just like now you're really on board on the roller coaster yeah. All right, Gary, how about you? Uh, my recommendation is a movie called Annihilation. Um, it came out in 2018 <laughs> with uh, Natalie Portman. It's and, a weird fucking uh, movie. <laughs> it, it is a very strange movie. Like, yeah. it's very weird. Uh, but the, it's got a lot of really interesting sort of uh, visual aspects to it, and the sound of it is really... Uh, the the way the the it's sound effects yeah it's it's great um yeah. it, it's a strange movie but uh I, I think it's worth a worth a watch absolutely uh neil i think you're back uh what do you got for us y'all mentioned it earlier and my recommendation is going to be uh 1979's the warriors uh oh, it's a very yeah. very Sweet. great film okay. for those of y'all who haven't seen it uh you know it's set in the quote unquote future of, you know, 1979 New York. But it's about <laughs> a street gang <laughs> trying to get back to its home turf from Coney Island. Uh, and it's, yeah. it's just a, a classic film. It really and, is. Uh, yep. Actually, I, I'd it like really to is, jump so. in and say uh, Johnny joined me <laughs> on my podcast uh, where we reviewed it. The episode, the episode has not come out yet. It, it's still going to co- be about like three weeks before yeah. that. Yeah, you guys should. Out. Everybody, check it out. Can't, I can't. I can't. Can't wait for everyone to it, wait to see it. It'll come out sometime in the future. 
Sometime oh. in the future. <laughs> if it's our time travel episode, then we'd be able to tell you. Oh, yeah. But we can't. Uh, so, guys, once again, Ian, thank you so much for joining hey, us. Uh, for check out me. Ian's Ian's podcast, uh, uh, Having a Beer with Ian. Yeah. And then and then midnight uh, movies so bad they're good midnight cult classics and camp or join the Facebook group of the same name uh, for Johnny Gary and Neil we will see you guys next week stay classy thank you for tuning in to Lead Feather Productions podcast of I Don't Give a Flick make sure to subscribe to our podcast so that you never miss an episode podcasts are available on Apple Spotify Google Podcasts YouTube and everywhere podcasts are hosted I Don't Give a Flick is hosted and produced by Johnny Blackburn, Gary Elmore, and Neil Riley. Executive producer, Johnny Blackburn. Technical director, editor, and audio mixer, Gary Elmore. I Don't Give a Flick is a Leadfeather production. Copyright Leadfeather Productions 2021.